Thanks, Alex. Uh, we, we tried very hard to get Megyn Kelly today, but she and John, Donald Trump are apparently <laughs> off somewhere. <laughs> um, as Katie mentioned, we're going to begin with a two-minute open, uh, state, open statements candidates. And uh, in an effort to be systematic and do things in order, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Powell and work this way. Uh, and if you would, uh, when you finish your statements or are cut off, whichever occurs first, if you would hand the, uh, the microphone to the uh, candidate immediately to your left when it gets down to the end, Katie will take over. So. Um, Good morning, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this morning, even before the cows get up. I'm J.P. Powell. I've been on the Winter Haven City Commission now on it, going on eight years. I've been involved with the City of Winter Haven for nearly 20 years, being involved with the Code Enforcement Board, the Planning Commission, the Housing Committee, and so forth. And it's been a real honor and, and a pleasure, so I think I know my way around City Hall, and I, City Hall, and I think I know a little bit about how the City of Winter Haven operates. And I'm married to Kim Travis Powell. I have one son, Travis Howard Powell, and one dog, PJ. I can't let her out. But, uh, but I always look forward to meeting with our folks in the city to learn what their complaints are, or what, they're, what they like, and, and uh, we move on from there. But it's always been an honor and a pleasure to serve the citizens of the city, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Willie Twyford, and um, I've been living in uh, Winter Haven since 1967. Um, went to school here at uh, St. Joseph's uh, Catholic School right across the, the town here, and uh, went on to uh, Winter Haven High School. From there, I went to Vanderbilt University. I graduated there, and I went to uh, Memphis State, you know, you know, the University of Memphis Law School. I passed the bar in Tennessee, and then I passed the bar in Florida. And as soon as I found out about passing the bar in Florida, I moved back home. And I've been here ever since, uh, except for a brief interlude. My wife, uh, Elizabeth, uh, got her PhD up at NC State in Raleigh, North Carolina. I passed the bar up there, practiced law up there as well. Came back down and um, worked for the state for about seven years, six years, and um, been in uh, private practice now for about two or three years on First Street, uh, south down here. Um, what I'd like to see happen is what, uh, with the city, is what I've put out uh, in my chamber questionnaire, those uh, four bullet points pretty much uh, hammered out. I'm different than my opponent in that uh, I'm looking for fiscal responsibility and I'm looking to uh, make sure that we can shore up our uh, processes of the pension plan and uh, making sure that we're not going to have another problem with uh, selling city property if we do so in the future. And uh, other than that, I'm just going to bring my experience as a lawyer here to the, to the uh, commission and hopefully uh, we can get progress done and make this a better place. Good morning. I'm Nathaniel Nat Birdsong Jr. I'm a second generation Winter Havian. Uh, I'm the uh, fourth oldest of 12 kids that my mom and dad had, and my dad passed away when I was a senior in high school, leaving behind the 12 ch children. Uh, my mama, in, on the 28th of this month, will be 98. Uh, so I'm, I'm really proud to have served the city of Winter Haven and its citizens for over 13 years. I'm a retired Coca-Cola executive of 27 years. I have a BS degree in mathematics from Florida A&M University where I taught uh, school junior high and senior high school in Fort Myers in Tampa. Uh, I have uh, earned an MBA degree from Nova Southeast University, and I currently run the Florence Villa Community Development Corporation, a 501c3 nonprofit. As I said, I retired in 2000, and I've been on the commission since 2002. The city of Winter Haven has undergone great changes in the last 13 years, and we have been able to maintain our standard of living. We have been able to continue to develop this city in spite of the uh, worst uh, downturn in my recorded history and most of you all's recorded history, unless you were around in 1929, 1930. And uh, we have not laid off anybody. We have not uh, reduced our services. We are continuing to develop our infrastructure. So 
I want to continue the job that I've been working on for the past 13 years, and so that's why I'm continuing to run for the city commission. Thank you. Good morning, it's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Bob Jardine. I've been a resident in Winter Haven for a total of 30 years, living in the same home for 25 years. And in 1996, I graduated from BCC with an AS degree in business management, marketing, and finance. And right after that, I took a continued education course in real estate so I could get my real estate license. And I am a strong advocate for the disabled and the senior citizens of Winter Haven. And my main issue is getting a good viable bus system that can take care of the seniors and the disabled, which we do not have at present. The transportation system is a total disaster and needs great attention. And that's my priority number one. And uh, I plan to serve with no special interest in, in mind, just to do the job for we the people of the city of Winter Haven, and thank you. Good morning, I'm gonna stand up, don't worry guys, I'm not gonna do this for every question, but I wanna be able to see you for the, uh, the opening statement. I'm Kemp Brinson, uh, two minutes, I can't tell you a lot about me, and I know that you are all gonna be educated voters and we'll check out my website, there's a little bit on the table out front. So I'm gonna spend my two minutes talking about two things that are very important to me. The first one is efficiency. Two years ago, I served as co-chair of the Efficiency Committee for the City of Winter Haven. We wrote a report uh, with 41 recommendations of ways to make the city run more efficiently, more transparently, and generate new revenue streams without raising taxes. There is no better example of the way that I will thoughtfully and carefully approach a leadership position with the city than that report. And I encourage you to go check it out. It's on the website. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the other important job of the city commissioner. In addition to serving on the city commission, you have another job. Your job is to be an outstanding ambassador and advocate for the city of Winter Haven in lots of other forums, on lots of other boards and committees. You have to be thoughtful, you have to be persuasive, and you have to be energetic. And I will make a very strong commitment to being an advocate for you, and I will be an outstanding advocate for the city of Winter Haven. I'm excited to be running, I'm excited about what this city uh, stands to accomplish in the next few years, and I hope that you'll be excited to say, I'm voting for Kemp. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Pete Chiquetto. Some of you I know, uh, most of you I know, some I don't know. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I thank uh, Katie and the Chamber, and as well as uh, Bob and his uh, law firm for putting this event on. Uh, for the past four years, I've been standing up for everyone in Winter Haven, not just the small interest groups, uh, not just the developers, not just uh, you know some other folks out there in, in their uh, realm trying to get something done, but but everybody. And and you may or may not agree with everything I've done. Uh, and, and as a chamber, I, I'll tell you, uh, I've been a partner of the business community for four years. I've gone to bat for the business community. I've gone to bat when it comes to what's doing right for Winter Haven. Uh, there, there's an issue on, on Lake Howard that we may not agree on, and that's the trail, uh, and, and that's fine. But I didn't get elected to agree with everybody. I got elected to serve the people of Winter Haven. That's what I've done for four years, and that's what I would continue to do for the next four years. Uh, I, I have uh, basically a wife that's been with Publix for 30 years. I've got an eight-year-old daughter uh, that I care much great, greatly about, and uh, those, that is my life, is my daughter, and so. I'm very active with her, uh, with her school, with her dance, uh, various things of that nature. And I'm very active in the, in the community. I've been on the Boys Club board for almost 12 years. I've been on the Salvation Army board for about 12 years now as well. And that, those two boards are near and dear to my heart. Uh, what I'm going to provide for the children of our community, there's about 600 kids that, that uh, go to three different clubs at the Boys Club. Uh, and then there at the Salvation Army, we're doing about 1,000 feedings a week when it comes to feeding the, the needy. Uh, so those two are a very good, strong passion for me. But the, the main important factor is standing up for all of our citizens in Winter Haven. And, and for four years, I have done that. I've been fiscally responsible uh, for this community. I have kept the public safe. I've looked out for the best interest of all of the public. And thank you for your time. <laughs> Good morning. 
Hi everyone, my name is Carmelo Garcia and I am your city commissioner candidate. I live in Winter Haven and I absolutely fell in love with it when I came here two years ago. Finally made the move over, I'm really excited. And um, I have a degree in business administration. I am the owner of two companies which I brought to Winter Haven hoping that it can grow and uh, bring job growth to the city of Winter Haven. I have uh, two nonprofits. One of them is a foundation for kids, which I hold very dear to my heart. It's just one of my passion, what I do. And I just hope that through your question, you get to know me a little bit better and I can answer your questions with passion and as much passion and enthusiasm as these gentlemen did. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is James Edward Hogan. I'm a um, citizen here in Winter Haven. I grew up here in Winter Haven. Um, attending Jewish primary, Jewish elementary, and, and Northeast junior high school. Um, my family moved away for a while, but when I became an adult, I came back to, Hanks, uh, to Winter Haven. Um, I, I'm a citizen that believes in a, a common sense approach to what I believe governing this city. And I, you know, I think that that's something that we have to get back to, make good decisions, um, especially when it comes to growth uh, I think growth is, is, is fantastic. That's how the city will, will progress. It just needs to be done responsibly. Um, I worked for the Polk County Sheriff's Office for 31 years. I started in 1981. I retired in 2013, January. Um, I was a captain for the last six years, running the South County Jail. I oversaw a $100 million project where we actually renovated the South County Jail and and added beds. That's not necessarily a good thing to have to add beds, but you know we needed to do that, and, and so I was a part of that. Um, I have a A degree from Polk State College, a BA degree from Warner University in organizational management. I've attended several leadership courses here in the city of Winter Haven. Um, I think that through uh, the through our help, I think that. One of the things I'd like to see us do is, is to broaden the successful uh, job that the, in the downtown area where we've really done a great job with, with growth and with um, um, businesses. I'd like to see us broaden that into the, the different quarters around the downtown area so that we can get even more um, growth in that area. So, thank you. Thank you for your opening statements, uh, candidate. <coughs> Uh, continue to proceed systematically and in order. We're going to start with Mr. Powell and, and again move down the line as uh, with, with these specific questions. Uh, Mr. Powell, in your response to the Chamber's questionnaire, you state that the city's support of commercial development can boost ad valorem collections and therefore city revenue. What specific steps do you think the city could take that would support and foster commercial development? And if reelected, what would you do in an effort to assure that such actions are taken? The downtown is, is probably one of our most important areas of, uh, of, of our area. Um, I do know that we have a number of businesses looking at the downtown corridor. Um, we have to go out and, and there, are some, there are some types of businesses that you can go out and try to bring in. Um, we are in de desperate need for, I think, uh, some more restaurants, and we need some more local shops. I think we need a, uh, a hotel to, to boost the downtown area. Um, not necessarily, maybe like a boutique type hotel or, or something. I know there's a place in Boston that I enjoy going to stay when we're up in that Boston area, and it's a beautiful little boutique hotel. And I always said I'd love to see one of those here in Winter Haven. But I think that if we can, if we can, go out and booster some of our uh, companies to try to sell downtown. I think once they come to see what downtown looks like, I think that they'll see that downtown Winter Haven is the place to expand their organization. And if we can do that, we just, we need to, we need to do whatever we need to do to make sure that happens. We'll have to work out this afternoon. I know. <laughs> Mr. Twyford, in your response to the Chamber's questionnaire, you raised concerns regarding the management of the pension fund 
how city money is invested, and the use of utility funds to cover general expenses. If you were elected, what specifically would you propose to do differently while maintaining a balanced budget? Well, the uh, pension fund, as most of you know, is a defined benefit plan. And what that includes is that uh, each employee and the general uh, employees, uh, what they're going to get is 3% a year. Um, the state of Florida, um, back, I, I worked for the state of Florida a while back, and um, a senior management employee was getting 2% a year. Um, when the, the new governor came in, like Scott, um, that pension plan was, pension plan was uh, changed and basically it's because of the uh, uncertainties of the uh, economics to fund that plan. So what happened was is that the um, new vested employees maintained their 2% plan, but all new employees uh, had to go with the uh, 401k type plans that they have. And what that does is reduces the risk that the city would have, and that's pretty much what we need. And we have to have a stopping point at some point in time to where we're going to be out of that uh, situation where we're on the hook for a you know, pension plan type of uh, payments. Um, you can go back to the reports, they're, they're out there, they're available. In 2008, I believe we had pension was 1.8 million that we paid in. And it's now, uh, I believe we're, we were in 2013, it was uh, 5.3 million. So we need to get out of that game. We need to go ahead and get into the uh, uh, pension plan that's a 401 type pension plan. We just pay a certain amount of money and then we're off the hook. So the risk is on the city for these up and down uh, fluctuations of the pension plan and then our, and our commitment to that. The, uh, the money that we get from the water that we sell, uh, that needs to be probably incorporated not to paying uh, type of situations where we're just meeting the, you know, to pay our salaries and, and recurring uh, things that come up every year, but maybe take that money and, and put it towards capital improvements so we wouldn't have to go out and bond $13 million uh, to build something to make the city nice. Uh, we, we don't have to take on all these projects at once. If we had to use that water money wisely each year or two, we could fund that and, and make it on down the road without having to get further and further into debt. Thank you. Mr. Birdsong, in your response to the Chamber's questionnaire, you mentioned how critically important it is to strategically plan and to have a strategic plan. Does the commission currently have an adopted strategic plan? And if so, if reelected, what would you do in an effort to assure that the city stays the course? And if it doesn't currently have a strategic plan, what would you do to ensure that a strategic plan is developed, approved, and implemented during your next term? Thank you. I need to take a part of my two minutes to introduce my wife of 46 years, Elizabeth Birdsong. <laughs> is in the audience and uh, I also have two sons and uh, four grandchildren. Now to the question of the strategic plan, over the past 13 years uh, the Civic Commission and the city, we have uh, worked on goals and objectives and a part of our goals and objectives process has been intertwined with what has been uh, given as a vision and an updated vision for the city of Winter Haven. The specifics of a strategic plan we have uh, not developed uh, the quote unquote terminology strategic plan. Uh, and in the coming years, I do know that for 2016, that we are planning to begin a strategic planning process with the city commission. And so uh, we will be doing that uh, in 2016. Mr. Jardine, in your opening statement and in your campaign materials, you mentioned the need for improvements to the current bus system. What specific changes do you recommend, and if elected, what specific proposals would you have regarding how the associated costs would be funded? If I heard correctly, the first thing I would do is get the uh, pending lawsuit that's pending. I would definitely get that 
taken care of as soon as possible so you don't have a hammer hanging on over our head with a lawsuit pending. I think that's been dragging out too long. It's irresponsible on the city's part, the commission, and the city manager's part. It should be taken care of as quick as possible. I talked to some of the commissioners and they've been saying the same thing for six months and it still isn't settled. That's a step in the right direction. How can you advance when you got a burden like a lawsuit hanging with not taking care of that? So I think that's the major step. And then the next step would be getting a viable bus system within the city itself, like the smart shuttle, to get people, senior citizens and disabled, to go around the city to help the business sustain themselves here, which we don't have. And as far as any investments, I think we shouldn't do nothing as far as any light improvements like trails and paths, that should be tabled for a while till the lawsuit gets settled. Any beautification act should be tabled till the lawsuit gets settled. Uh, I think that's one thing that, it's just like in your own uh, home or business, you got a major lawsuit, you got to take care of it. That's only sensible. And we're just, we're just not doing it the right way, I think. And that's about all I got to say on it. Thank you. If anyone would like to sponsor a second microphone at the time, I'm open to discuss afterwards. <laughs> Mr. Renson, in your opening statement and in your response to the Chamber's questionnaire, you referenced that you served as co-chair of the Citizens Efficiency Review Committee. Uh, and that committee uh, made over 40 recommendations to the city. Which of those recommendations do you believe have been most successfully implemented? And of those which have not been implemented, which one would be your top priority to implement if elected? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the Fish Committee was a wonderful experience, and um, and I think you know a lot of what's in the report is very high quality. Uh, the most important recommendation that we need to move forward on immediately, and this was detailed in the report, is strategic planning. Uh, we've had, I mean, we've kind of known this for a while, and and haven't done it. And it's time to bite the bullet and do it. I know that that staff has pushed forward an effort to do some strategic planning, but that's largely been staff driven and the commission has okayed it and you know i'm sure that the current commissioners would say yes we're leading the effort for strategic planning but it's really staff and the commission has just approved what what staff has put forward and i think the commission really needs to drive forward with strategic planning and most importantly the commission needs to be reviewing those strategic plans and seeing what the progress has been made what progress has been made towards completing those plans as time uh, goes on um, in terms of recommendations that are that have been done i think that um most of the ones that have been successfully implemented have been the more staff level uh, type things, uh, things that staff can implement um, on their own. One of those has been the, um, uh, the reduction of uh, garbage from two days a week to one day a week. That was already underway when we did our report and uh, has, has largely been completed at this point. So, um, so that, that's one example. But the big picture stuff, the stuff that's really a commission level responsibility has not been done and strategic planning is, is the top priority there. Mr. Ticato, in your response to the Chamber's questionnaire, you stated that annexation is a primary opportunity and it would allow the city to increase overall taxable value and thus revenues. If you're reelected, what steps would you advocate that the city take in pursuing areas for potential annexation? And in the case of residential areas where, where a referendum would be required, what would the city do in an effort to convince the residents of those areas that annexation would be to their benefit? Thank you. Uh, first of all, annexation is, is important. And I think we can look at um, our big partner out there called Legoland. Uh, Legoland has been outside the city since they came to town. I'd love to have them be a partner with Winter Haven. How cool would it be to get off of US 27 and see what I would consider Lego block lights coming down to get into the park or, or a theme from US 27 that says, welcome to Winter Haven and welcome to Legoland to get them into the park. Uh, the second part of that question was annexation of, of infill communities, uh, in particular, you know, the, the areas that, that we provide water and sewer to and, and two-thirds of our services to, um, but yet they don't pay for services like the library, 
They don't pay for services like our recreation facilities. So to, to address that annexation concern, it's simply going to those homeowners and, and convincing them that Winter Haven is a great place to live, work, and play, and it's cheaper than you're probably paying in the county. And, and we don't have a fire tax. We don't have a fire fee. Um, so that would go away. If we can show them that there's a zero increase in their taxes, then it makes sense for them to annex into Winter Haven and become part of our, our great city. If you have not turned in your question yet to Jennifer, please lift up your note card and Jennifer will come and grab that for you as well. Mr. Garcia, in your response to the Chamber's questionnaire, you refer to several opportunities that the city has and specifically mentioned the redevelopment of the Channel Lakes Complex, Normeo Hall, and the building of the city civic center. Your response states that the city could do all this and spend minimal taxpayer dollars. If elected, how would you propose to pursue these opportunities? What minimal city tax dollars do you think would be required? And what revenue source or sources would be used to fund the cost in excess of the city's contribution? Yes, um, I actually did say that and it's, it's really easy. I'm going to go ahead and explain that the plan. It's basically what you call partnerships with major companies. If, if you, I'm sorry about that. I usually speak loud so I hold it down. Um, corporate, uh, partnering with corporate companies, big companies, for example, Legoland. Everybody is so worried about uh, the uh, Cypress Garden area and nobody's worried about anything before that. The building that we have right across the street from City Hall is a great opportunity for the city to go ahead and get that. We should negotiate with major companies and partner with them so that they can go ahead and help the city pay for stuff that we actually need uh, to, to attract people to come to the, down to Winter Haven. Like uh, Mayor, uh, Commissioner Chetto here uh, said, we need to make sure that people have something to come and see. Downtown area, there's no bus connections, there's no anything, so why don't we partner with companies and make sure that we have something for people to actually come and see. I believe that if we partner with companies and we do it responsibly without making any promises to anybody or selling any property or doing anything, but just saying, hey, we have a wonderful city, we want you to come and see it, we have Legoland, but we don't have anything else to keep them coming back. They don't have anything else to go see but Legoland. So they're gonna come, spend a night, visit Legoland, and then go where? Orlando, Kissimmee, everywhere else. But if we bring stuff down that people can actually stay a week or two, we will make money, we will grow, and then we can worry about everything else. So we need to partner with other companies to make sure that they see the value, the worth of coming to Winter Haven, and not just focusing on two areas, downtown and Cypress Lakes. Thank you. Mr. Hogan, in your response to the Chamber's questionnaire, you stated that the city should continue efforts to bring new businesses that are in line with current businesses and specifically reference CSX. And you mentioned the use of responsible incentives that keep us competitive but allow for quicker economic impact. If elected, what specific types of incentives would you recommend and how would you measure the economic impact and return on those investments? Well, what I was talking in reference was, you know, CXX, of course, is a great opportunity. Um, I know that we are, we're, we're trying to recruit and they are trying to recruit businesses into that particular area. What my concern is that in the offering, whether it's um, tax-free um, situations or impact-free or lower impact, those kind of things are, are, are good and it actually brings, will help bring those um, companies then. However, I just, I believe that it should not be a situation where um, we decide it's such a long-term break that the impact of, um, that the city would get would just be too long. Um, we should um, look at the surrounding areas, like I said, and be competitive, but be responsible with it and not give away um, the city uh, for those companies unless we can realize a, a quicker impact. We need, we need to be able to get tax dollars and the citizens of Winter Haven need to be able to, to have those particular revenues quicker. 
Okay, now we will start with the audience questions. So if you do come up with another question while we are doing this portion, just lift your card in the air and Jennifer will grab it from you. You ready? Yes. Okay. A few of the questions uh, have been directed at specific candidates, so I'll start with those. Um, the first is directed at Mr. Powell. Uh, what will you do to generate more business interest in Winter Haven? And what is your specific plan? We have to have public-private partnerships, and to be able to do more, to bring more business to our community, we have to form the business-private partnerships, and um, or the city, uh, the uh, government-private businesses or partnerships. And um, in, number one, we have to work closely with our chamber of commerce to help promote our chamber of commerce and to help the chamber partner with us to get our name out there. Winter Haven Economic Development Corporation, we have to work with them. Central Florida Development Council, which plays a big part in not only Winter Haven, but Polk County and the surrounding areas. So we have to form that, that private-public partner relationship to encourage them to work with us and to help generate business and bring businesses to this area. Uh, this one is directed to Mr. Birdsall says, without a strategic plan, how do we have a, quote, roadmap, end of quote, for our city, for where our city is to go? Thank you. Uh, we have a uh, strategic initiatives that we pursue. One such example, the whole idea of uh, goal setting is what we have pursued. Uh, when you talk about uh, the economic development, uh, a strategic initiative that was followed was basically uh, forming the uh, Economic Development Council. And um, we, the city, pays for that. Over the course of the last uh, 15 years, there have been uh, visioning that basically was from the citizens. The city took that vision on and tried to implement and did implement it. So when you say strategic plan and strategic uh, plan, we've had strategic initiatives that we have pursued and we're continuing to pursue. Uh, when, you, when you think about uh, the development that has taken place, uh, I see some former commissioners out here when we were talking about uh, downtown redevelopment. Well, you may not call that a strategic plan, but it was a strategic initiative that was implemented. So the thing that we have to pursue is what we've been doing, calling goals. Uh, some people may say that we have, in fact, have a strategic plan, but what we're going to do is put it in a document, like the visioning documents uh, that we have. So. Those are the things that, that, that we will be pursuing. Thank you. This one is directed to Mr. Garcia. It says that you have recently moved your office. Uh, I didn't write this, but it looks like it could be my handwriting. Um, and then I apologize if you ever did write this. But my handwriting is really bad. You've re recently moved your office uh, from, from, oh, I beg your pardon. You've recently run for office in Kissimmee. Uh, when did you move to Winter Haven, and why choose to run in Winter Haven, being so new to the community? I did. When I first left New York, I uh, did not want to come to Florida. I hate the heat. It's not my friend, and I didn't want to come here. But my mom, who's sitting outside, told me, you need to come visit. The minute I landed and came out of the airport, I saw how beautiful it was. And I just I fell in love with Florida. And Kissimmee was my first stop. And I stood there. I've always wanted to help my community. Everywhere I go, in New York, uh, Florida, Chicago, wherever I've been, I've always helped my community. In Kissimmee, I ran for commissioner twice. Unfortunately, I have not been successful in winning a seat. 
But um, I keep fighting for what I believe in, and I keep fighting for what I believe the people need. And I decided to run, I moved here in March of this year. I've been to Winterhaven before, my nonprofit organization serves in the community, and we do events, like the one we're doing at Regions uh, for November, the weekend of November for Thanksgiving. We're gonna be giving away turkeys to homeless families. So those are the type of events we do. Why do I wanna run for city commissioner here in Winterhaven? I believe that it, you know what, it's not, we're human, we all make mistakes, and mistakes have been made. But it's time to stop thinking like the old and start thinking about the new. Stop making the same mistakes over and over and over again. We need to start keeping in mind, focus on what's important, which is being uh, business sound. We're, we're running and we're serving the people of Winter Haven. Um, some of the, the mayor said that we need to bring companies over. Everybody's saying we need to bring companies over. No company wants to come to Winter Haven because they know that there's no people no business, so they're going to come here to die. So if you grow the people, if you grow the, the, the things that we need to bring here, like Orlando has, uh, what is it, um, Disney and all these other places, if we grow and we get more stuff that people want to come here and do, then we're going to get those companies to want to come here instead of us pursuing them, giving away taxes and, and impact fees. That's, that's a no-no. Because when, thank you. I have to tell you, I was envisioning having to get rough with some of you for going over. So far, you haven't given me that opportunity. <laughs> uh, this one is directed to Mr. Jardine. Uh, this question says, it's great to have a more helpful transit system. How do we offer this to students in our school system for free? Could you repeat that again? Yes. He said, it's great to have a good transit system. How would we offer that to the students in our school system for free? Well, number one, the transit system, we have two types of transit systems that's available for the city, and that's uh, paratransit that goes door to door, and the smart shuttle that goes from quadrant to quadrant, which used to go from, door, from curb to curb, which they cut out on July 6th, and now it's going quadrant to quadrant. And we got bus drivers that's working eight hours a day, riding in a circle, picking up two passengers a day when they used to pick up 30 a day. And that's been going on since July 6th. And nobody's doing anything to change it, modify it, or anything else. So that's number one, needs to be getting squared away. And I'd like the city to try to apply for the grant to take over the smart shuttle from Lakeland and keep it in our own city and take care of our own people is what we need to do. And I think it's an easy task, just uh, apply for the grant like we did with the bus system when it originally started to get the bus system 13 years ago. And uh, a good system is gonna help plus getting strategic pe business people to move into downtown that's gonna stay a while. We used to have a bakery downtown that was a striving business that did terrific. Uh, it used to bring people downtown. Do we have a bakery now? I don't think so. That would be one initiative to bring people downtown on a regular basis. Plus maybe going to the avenue of computer software or making small parts for computer light industry. That's another way they could go to bring people uh, to the city. And, uh, but we need to get more strategic on allowing what type of business to come to the basic downtown area. We don't need 15 restaurants downtown for sure. We need to get the people to use the restaurants. So they gotta be more specific on what their type of business they're allowing to come into the community. This question is directed to Mr. Chiquetta. In 2013, you were removed from the CFRPC WHEDC and TDC boards for non-attendance. How do you justify this, and how do you have proper time to commit to being an advocate for Winter Haven? Well, let me clarify the, the record first. Um, the word removed is a little uh, misguiding. First of all, every year we, we change seats in terms of liaison boards. Um, secondly, if you go look at the record, um, yes, 
the CFDC, the well, I, mean, I apologize, Bob, but you've rattled off so many boards it's kind of gone confusing. But um, the boards we, we change hands every year, and if you go look at the record, uh, if you look at the city commission record for four years uh, of meetings attended, everybody is is, is guilty. So. Uh, of missing liaison meetings. If you look at the TPO board meetings that I was a part of, uh, I attended 86% of the meetings. We say, well, it's not 100%. I'm the only commissioner on the board that has a eight-year-old daughter or a child under the age of 18. I'm the only commissioner that works uh, out of town. And to say that uh, these boards aren't important is, is, is not true. They're all important boards. So what I've done is, as a commissioner is try to make time, the best time available and, and meet on uh, meetings that are now via conference call or ways that I can continue to work full time and make, make adjustments in our schedule. Um, I'm 110% committed to the city of Winter Haven. Uh, I grew up here. I ran four years ago with intentions of looking out for the future of our town and, and the future of our town is, is a great town and city to be a part of. And that's my intention is to continue moving that agenda forward. Uh, you'll see $14 million in, in new projects coming on soon. Those are mostly projects for recreation. Those projects are going to help sustain our community and, and put us in the right direction for moving things forward. Uh, so with that being said, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, this question is directed to Mr. Twyford. How many city commission meetings have you attended? And have you done any work on any city boards or city committees to help you prepare for the job as commissioner? Uh, let's see, um, <clears throat> I started going to city commission meetings back, I think, when the landings issues came up and uh, they were going to move the pool and they were to talk about moving the, the, uh, the arts complex. My brother, uh, some of you know Eddie, uh, to Whiteford. He was attending those meetings and um, really it's only about maybe 200 yards away from my house. I live on Lake Silver. And so I started attending because I'm on the board of directors at Sertoma, the Winter Haven Greater uh, Youth Baseball League and my children played out there, all three of them. And uh, you know, we that place has been in disrepair since we were there and it kind of hasn't changed much since when I played there. So I started going to those meetings at that time, trying to find out how the process was and, and what happened and decide where these monies were going to be spent. And total, I don't really know, I don't have a number to put on it, but you know, I probably would say at least 12 a year I would go to. And uh, sometimes more frequently than others when issues I was interested in came up. Um, I'm a lawyer and I understand a lot of the questions that are being uh, proposed to the, the commission. Um, I also you know, think that uh, I ask people that when I don't know something, uh, even in law, I uh, ask other lawyers uh, for, to help me you know, find the answer to questions. I can do all the research. Um, I think my experience as a lawyer would help me uh, and uh, be able to go ahead and make decisions and uh, also to get to research the issues that are before the, the commission. I think that, uh, that, you know, that one thing, being a lawyer, sets me apart from my opponent. And I think that you know, is probably what's kind of neat. I, I would never have voted to go with the, the landings deal to begin with. And uh, the, the handling of the lawsuit, I disagree with how that's come about as well. Um, I think that you know, my experience as a lawyer and, and the knowledge that I have as being a lawyer would be helpful to, to the commission. Uh, there are some other questions directed specifically, specifically at candidates, but there have been a couple of folks who did have uh, questions directed specifically at them, so I want to make sure we uh, give everybody a fairly equal opportunity. So this one, I will, this question will be directed to you, Mr. Hogan. Um, since Nora Mayo Hall has been closed, our city is in great need of a public space to hold community events, wedding receptions, nonprofit fundraisers, etc. We're the only city in Polk County without this type of facility. What would be your plan, if elected, for the city to rectify this issue? I think what the the city has already started um, reference to Norma Hall, such as you know, I think there's a question of whether or not that property should be turned back over to the city based on um, the city actually giving that land um, to the the state. And if we can't get it back that particular way, then we should 
uh, we, we, and I think we made a $1 million bid. Um, I think we should do whatever we can to try and get it back if that means we have to up our bid or if that means we need to continue to pursue the state and, 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 its, and the legislatures to um, see if we can get it back based on the fact that the land was donated by the city. Thank you. Uh, well, after that last statement I made, someone brought in a question uh, specifically from Mr. Brinson. Um, and it's two parts. Uh, part one, has the preparedness of city commissioners been lacking in the past few years? And secondly, what steps would you take to ensure that you arrive at meetings well prepared for the meetings? Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that preparedness on the commission has been a problem. I think if you go to a commission meeting, you don't walk out of that meeting thinking, man, they really knew a lot about that issue before they showed up here today. Um, I am going and have already structured my life and my schedule so that I can spend considerable amount of time preparing for meetings. Um, I've made a pledge openly to be the most transparent commissioner in Winter Haven history, which means that when I do research on agenda items that are coming before the commission, I will post the results of what I found out, the questions I've asked, the answers that I've gotten, the documents I've received on my website so you can see exactly what I've been doing to prepare for meetings so that you know that I'm going into those meetings prepared. And if there's anything you think that I've missed or have not seen that needs that I need to see, you'll know that I'm deficient in that area before the meeting and can bring those things to my attention as a member of the public. Um, so I will be very transparent and show you exactly what I'm doing to prepare for those meetings so there won't be any question about whether I'm prepared for meetings. This is a question that is directed to all the candidates, and what I will do is I'll pose the question and then uh, Katie can give you the uh, mic, Mr. Powell, and we'll let Katie rest as you all pass the mic down. Uh, but, but the question is, please indicate your current position on a fire fee. I was the only commission that voted to keep it on, on the agenda, but to keep moving forward with it. And the reason I voted for it was I did not want to see us cancel the public hearings. I wanted to know what the citizens thought. I wanted to know what, they are, what their arguments were. There's good things, there's bad things. The one thing that uh, my current position is, um, it's gone away. It's not gonna happen, so I really don't have a position on it any further. Uh, my position on the, on the fire tax is a, is a tax that's, I mean, people would call it a fee, but it's basically a tax and I'm against it. And that's because uh, the, you know, we have enough money in our budget and how much money that we take in that if it's properly managed, we don't have to go out and raise those taxes or raise those fees. Um, I, you know, I was shocked when it was brought up at first anyway, because I think it's because that when government sees these other types of uh, available sources of income, they don't really think of anything more than just go ahead and, and, and put a fee on somebody and get more income, as opposed to you know, making the hard decisions uh, like the uh, general pension fund. And I want to point out that doesn't affect the uh, fire or the police pension fund. Uh, those are different funds, those are different uh, uh, types of situations, and those people in those, those type of class of those pensions um, do have a, um, a, you know, they're harder to find those kind of people, and uh, you know, those things can uh, be justified that they do you know, a job, they risk their lives. Um, but the fire tax is this, uh, you know, it comes in as a little bit and then sooner or later they can change that whenever they want. They can raise it way, way up and then citizens don't have any chance to say, wait, stop, hold the, hold the brakes, you know. Um, it's, a, it's like a floating type of tax that they can uh, assign to any, any you know, time they want to come up with a new budget um, and, they, and they look for something to make more money, they can just tap that fire tax and uh, people wouldn't even know it. So uh, that's why I'm against it. And um, I, I can't really think of any reason to be for it. The uh, fire assessment, uh, we voted not to implement it. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, initially when we were looking at the projects that we wanted to fund, we wanted to fund those projects in their entirety. We had been told that it would take a certain amount of funding, which was in the neighborhood of 13 
million dollars. And in order to fund a $13 million bond with our uh, great rating that we have, you would need a dedicated financial source to basically ensure that you could repay the bond. Um, and so therefore, we were looking at ways and the fire assessment was such a, a way. But subsequent to the final vote on implementing that fee, we looked at uh, funding a lesser bond and uh, being able to do that without any fire assessment but having it tied to the uh, Avalorum rate that we currently have. So the projects that we uh, decided that we needed to implement, one thing's a fact, in the city of Winter Haven, we have not had any substantive uh, projects in the neighborhood of recreation in over 15 years, maybe even longer than that. So we needed to do some things and therefore we were able to uh, fund these projects without raising taxes and without um, actually implementing a fire assessment fee. So uh, we have done what we have been doing over the past 13 years. We have been able to manage the monies of the city and do things that we need to do to improve for all of the citizens. Thank you. Same question. Same question. Yeah. Well, fire all the it's it's all the fire assessment. How would you stay with the fire assessment? The fire assessment fee? Yes. Well, fire assessment fee, uh, I look at it to a different avenue rather than always looking for funding. There's other means to serve fire department. I've been involved in the fire service for several years. I've been to Texas Fire and M a Texas A and M Fire Academy, which is the largest academy in the world. I've been at Houston Fire Academy. I've been in the fire service for seven years, and there's other means of handling fire departments. You got the volunteers that you could start up in the city which the county contributes, they have a quota, you have so many structure fires, the county pays the city a certain amount of dollars, you got grass fires, the county pays a certain amount of money. So you don't necessarily have to right away jump on a bandwagon to have a paid fire department. A volunteer fire department can do just as good as a paid department. And it would be good for the kids and the young 21 year olds to 30 year olds to participate and that would help more participation in the community with a volunteer section to part participating. So that's what I would look at rather than going out and spending more money when you could do it with volunteers. And so many cities around the country, that's all they have. In Texas, that's the majority. And they do a fine <coughs> job so that's all I got to say. Uh, on the fire fee, uh, I think that we made a real mistake in the way that we approached the fire fee. Uh, there's no question that there are significant large property owners in the city of Winter Haven who are heavy burdens on our fire system who do not pay ad valorem taxes, therefore they're not paying for the heavy burden that they impose on the system. The fire fee is one way to bring those um, those property owners into the tax base so that they are helping contribute to the system that they're using. The problem is we did not clearly think through what the political implications of the fire fee were. And if you're going to raise taxes and impose new fees on citizens, you better be able to justify it. And we were not able to justify it, and it died due to political pressure from the citizens. I would have supported the fire fee if it had benefited the fire department, and it did not. I would have supported the fire fee if there had been a corresponding ad valorem tax reduction to offset the additional burden on people who are already paying taxes, and as proposed, it did not. And I would have supported the fire fee if it had had a more streamlined, easier to receive benefit, or excuse me, easier to receive exemption for truly destitute homeowners who cannot afford it. And there are certainly those people, we do not want to make 
did not want to make that a regressive fee. Um, but that there, there was a process for that as proposed, but I thought it could have been simpler and easier. Um, so those are the only conditions under which I would have supported the fire fee. Um, because it's died, because we tried and it failed um, you know, so gloriously, we're probably not going to be able to bring it forward again um, for a while. So I, I don't know if that's something that, that can move forward now or not. It may be something to look at in the future. Um, but I wish that we'd had more foresight going into it and we might have been able to justify it to our citizens if we had. All right, first of all, I want to uh, back up and, and touch on one subject that I didn't have enough time for, and I'll get to the fire fee really quick. Uh, that is that is my record. Uh, you can point fingers at a liaison board all day long, but go to the commission meeting record for four years, and I can tell you, standing here in front of you today, I've done my research. The number one commissioner on the board for missing zero meetings, Stephen Honeycutt. Number two, myself. I've missed one meeting in four years. The worst attendant is not running for re-election, but you'll figure it out. There's only five of us up there. Okay, so on to the fire fee. Uh, the fire fee, I, I couldn't agree more with what Kemp said. Uh, we didn't have a good plan. We had a plan that was going to generate $1.6 million. It was a common day shell game. When you take money from the general fund, of 1.6 million fund recreation projects. That's what we were going to do. You would have had to fill a void in the fire department, and that's where the fire fee came from. It would have cost me $86 a year. Not a big deal. I would be glad to pay it. However, the fire fee should go towards new buildings, new employees, new equipment, and new new abilities to provide service for our citizens, not recreation projects. And that's what we had it in the budget for. I came up with a creative plan. I said we're going to take a one-time sale of assets and put it towards the projects, the $13.5 million projects. We're going to bond $6.2 million. We're not going to raise taxes with that $6.2 million, and we don't need a fire fee. I'll be glad to look at a fire fee in the near future if need be. That would indicate to our citizens that we're going to buy new equipment, we're going to put new employees on the streets, and then we're going to build a new fire station with a fire fee. I'll gladly support that. But the current fee that we had in place did not do that. That's all. Thank you. Fire fee. I don't support it. Uh, any fee that raises taxes on the citizens for other projects other than what they say they do is totally irresponsible. And going back to the meetings of Mr. Like the Commissioner Chichetto, um can miss the meetings and whatnot, I'm going to be very honest with you. The people who elect the Commissioner that can support them and be there for them and when we're taking vacations, uh, spring break vacations and missing meetings, uh, that's not very responsible. And on more than one occasion, you have missed meetings. And how is it that you're going to miss a meeting on, on very important issues like a fire fee, for example, and then take the money that comes from the fire fee to build uh, parks? For example, in my statement, you can see it online. A $134,000 project to improve parks like Ship Park, Girls, uh, Girl Scout Park, <coughs> Rotary Park. These are issues and fees that these people should be, these companies, these organizations should be contributing to the city instead of the citizens of the city paying taxes like fire fees that are not going towards the fire department and building new firehouses that are closer to uh, other uh, sections. So this is why I'm against fire fees, if, like uh, Kemp said. If it's not going towards one specific and it doesn't have a specific, why, why approve it? Why even bother bringing it up if it's not going to go to serve for the purpose that it was meant to be served? So as a fire fee, I am totally opposed unless it's going for what is exactly meant to be, which is the fire department growing that and helping out in those areas. Thank you. The, um, the, the fire fee, I agree that it's, it's basically a tax and it's just like in any other tax. So anytime we are going to um, take money from our citizens, we better have a good reason for doing it. We need to be able to justify it. I, I think as you move forward in any city or any, you know, any county, those sort of things are going to come up. Those uh, looking for different revenue sources are going to come up. And we have to look at those things and make good, responsible decisions. Thank you. Right, we have time for one more question for each candidate. Um, and if your question does not get asked, I'm sure the candidates may have a couple minutes afterwards to hang behind to um, answer your question. So, Bob. Uh, some other specifically directed questions have come in. This one is uh, from Mr. Birdsall. 
Uh, it says a strategic plan to be successful requires compromise, consensus building, and five commissioners pursuing a single agenda, not five separate agendas. If re-elected, how would you work to build a more focused, committed commission? One of the things that uh, is a prerequisite for serving as a city commissioner, and that is that the decisions that you make have to be for all of the people and not just for a specific group of people. Over the past years, the major, the major decisions that we have agreed upon uh, has taken a toll on us all. We sit and we debate uh, and we talk. But at the end of the day, I think if all of the commissioners, and this has been the case in the past, when the facts are presented, everybody can basically review those facts and come up with the best decision possible. Now, how do we build that on the commission? One of the ways that we, we've had to do it is, uh, especially over the past year, two years, is have more workshops so there's time for discussion. You can't build consensus sometimes in the time period that we have in the commission meetings, but by having the workshops, then we're able to enter react. Also, every year we have had a goal planning retreat, and in that retreat, we go over and establish goals. And the process of, of building consensus is that there is no way around it. Uh, there are five of us and three rules. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. And so that's what we do is we set, we discuss, and then we have to vote. And uh, we can be disagreeable, but not be really disagreeable. All right? Uh, this question I'll pose to Mr. Powell. How adequately do you feel the city's investment is in its infrastructure, and what percentage of the city's budget should be dedicated annually to catch up and keep ahead of uh, depreciation? I want to know who wrote that question because it's very early in the morning to be answering these types of questions. <laughs> well, would you repeat that again? I'll try. I'll speak loudly to save Katie the footsteps. How adequately do you feel the city has been investing in its infrastructure? And what percentage of the city's budget should be dedicated to catch up and stay ahead of depreciation? To stay ahead of depreciation um, without knowing exactly how much you've got to work with, it's hard to, it's hard to de uh, determine. <coughs> The, the planning, uh, we have quite a few projects that are gonna be completed this year, but you have to rely on staff because they're the ones that are trained in those fields. I'm not trained in those fields. So when we sit down to do the budgeting process, we find out exactly how much has to be put towards the infrastructure. For instance, our, our roads. Uh, every year there's a certain number of dollars that are set aside to do road improvements, sidewalk improvements, uh, utility improvements, and all those figures we have to have. We just passed the new budget. They'll already be working on those figures for next year. So we have to, we have to really rely on staff to give us those answers because like I said, I'm not trained or I'm not, you know, I don't know what it costs to, per linear foot to, to, to fix a road or a sidewalk or to improve. So I rely on staff a lot. If I don't know the answer to a question, I go and I find the answer.
This question I'll direct to uh, Mr. Twyford. Um, it says that the Winter Haven has a strong pedigree and has earned a national and international reputation for excellence in the arts. What can the city do in an effort to preserve and enhance its commitment to the arts? And then it goes on to say there are tickets still available for Sister Act. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Clark, I don't know that you need to comment on that last part. Yeah, I'll comment on Sister Act. I saw it on Friday and it is phenomenal. So fabulous. So get your tickets, only a few seconds. Well, it's kind of a compound question, but I'll try to get to the first part. I, I mean, I'm a fan of the arts. I'm a fan of the, any type of recreational activities. And I mean, I think it's true that Winter Day Haven does have a national, if not international, reputation for the arts. And, I, and I'm, I'm Kemp's uh, really involved in that. And I've been to many meetings when Kemp speaks up and tells us what's going on down there. And, um, you know, just being living in this community, growing up in this community, I walk around and see the art that we have in Central, you know, the park here. Um, I like the... Um, the art that we see on the side of the buildings here that uh, I think 610 has brought in some people that have done that and it's really improved the aesthetic of the city. I'm all for that. And that's good. this one one part of it, um, but it should also be funded as well. And I think that that's, you know, the, the part of all this thing comes down to is the proper management of money. And uh, that's why we, you know, we take these big bonds out and pay for things. But we're better, you know, able to go ahead and look at the big thing that we're doing here. And that's what the strategic plan is. We don't have these uh, special... Uh, strategic uh, initiatives. When you intertwine all those in initiatives, that's when you get the uh, the plan. And the strategic plan needs to be it needs to be developed you know, a long time ago. I mean, this is hurry up to catch up with the, with the strategic plan. But part of that plan is the arts. We have to you know foster the arts and we have to maintain the arts and just like all the other recreational facilities. I don't think and I'm not putting the sports facilities ahead of the arts. I'm not putting the arts ahead of the recreational facilities for sports. I mean, it's part of the whole. Uh, you know, big picture of how to make Winter Haven a better city, and that needs to be part of the strategic plan. Uh, this question is for Mr. Jardine. Um, it says, uh, what would you do, if elected, to help maintain and enhance the good partnership between the city and downtown developers to ensure that that progress continues? Well, first of all, I'll get the Chamber of Commerce involved. First of all, I'll get the Chamber of Commerce involved, at least to meet with some of the business owners. If they don't want to come to a chamber meeting, I think they should have a couple that go visiting the people, because a lot of times business people don't have the time, so Maybe the chamber could stretch it out a little bit and go visit with them to get some input uh, from the businesses. And if they see any light that could help, uh, get their opinion on a one-on-one -on -one basis if they can't make meetings. But you got to have cohesion between the citizens as well as the chamber and the city commission as well. When you ask the city commission for assistance on something, they should just say, not, I'll check on it and not get back with you. They should check on it and respond back, which I had encounters, which I asked several city commissioners to help me with issues. They said they'll call me and get back with me. It never happens. The county is the same way. You call the city, the county, send emails. The county managers don't even respond. So it needs to be uh, a little bit better communications between the people and the city government. <clears throat> this question is for Mr. Brinson. Uh, what ideas and suggestions uh, would you be making regarding increasing the city tax base? Uh, we've already discussed the fire fee, so I'm not going to go into that again. Uh, the second thing, obviously, is, is annexation. The issue with annexation is that you, it can't be something you just try to do on the spur of the moment. You have to have a long-term plan for how you're going to approach it because you've got to convince a majority of the citizens in that area to want to annex. And that takes a concerted effort, concerted advocacy, a concerted effort at building incentives for them to want to do that, including tax incentives and services. We have to make that case, and that case can't be made in six months or a year. It has to be made over time. Uh, so as part of our strategic planning process, I'd want to have you know three, five, and 10-year goals for annexation. 
where we need to decide which areas we're going to target first, which specific areas we're going to target first, how we're going to target those areas, and how we're going to spend years, not just a few months, advocating for and making it beneficial for the citizens in those areas to annex into the city. That's why the strategic plan is so important. I want to define that. We haven't really defined that today. Strategic planning, in, in my view, takes your vision of where you want to be, which is a city that has a broader tax base in this case, and actually sets reasonable one, two, three, four, five-year goals and numeric targets to getting there so that you're focused on your long-term goals on a day-to-day -day basis. And by going through that exercise, we can come up with an annexation plan, but we have to commit to that exercise. Over the past four years, we have not committed to that exercise until very, very recently, uh, in part in response to staff, in part in response to the Efficiency Committee's work. Um, and so I would spearhead that and make sure that we have a clear annexation plan that covers a multi-year process to make that happen in specific target areas. Uh, Mr. Chiquetto uh, says, many young people are forced to leave Winter Haven in order to find a job. What will you do to bring jobs and businesses to Winter Haven in order to keep these young people around? Thank you. Um, you know, economic development has been on the forefront for myself and, and the commission as a whole for the last four years. Uh, we saw the, the impact we've had with CSX, we saw the impact we've had with downtown, and I would say leaving Winter Haven to find a job, all that starts kind of at the, at the base level of our education and letting folks know that when you go away to UCF or UF or even FSU, you can come back to, to Winter Haven and find a job. And there are, are opportunities out there, and I'll, I'll use uh, myself as an example, I'll look at Katie as, as an example. When you go away, you got to remember where you came from, and, and there are opportunities out there. And, and it starts with providing the right information. It also starts with in our in our schools because I'll tell you right now, our labor force, whether you're in construction, underground utilities, uh, it, it's very poor. You can't find quality help in those areas. But if you're in the IT department, if you're in a, a, a education level. You can always find a job at Polk County School Board. There's work out there every, you know, in, in all aspects there. If you're looking for new jobs, new businesses, that's what we've done. We've created incentives that already exist. Uh, we've created an investment in our downtown. We've created an investment at CSX, and we'll continue to do that. And that would lure folks back for, for good, high-paying jobs. Uh, you can look at our hospital. Uh, Baycare is expanding. They've done a tremendous thing in the last short amount of time. Uh, when it comes to adding new jobs, uh, if some folks go away to law school, you've got two attorneys here uh, on, the, on the board. They're you know, looking to, to become council uh, members. They've come back to town after leaving to, you know, to go away to school. Uh, so there is opportunity, and I think we have to do a better job of selling the opportunity and, and pointing out the facts that Winter Haven is a great place to live, work, and play, and raise a family. Mr. Garcia, we had a, a late question come in uh, directed to you, uh, and it relates to uh, the nonprofits that you mentioned in your opening statement. Uh, the, the person was asked what the name of those nonprofits are and what their missions are. Okay. Uh, the two nonprofits is uh, CIA uh, Chaplains in Action. It's a religious non for profit organization, and what we do is we work with law enforcement emergency response teams to make sure that they have what they need to do their job correctly. Uh, chaplains are very important with, with law enforcement, uh, hospital, prisons, and in the street. We also have the Keep Our Kids Safe Foundation, and we deal with kids, single families, and homeless families that are in the streets. We help with clothes, with food, with um, uh, utility payments, uh, rent payments, anything that has to do with helping them and their quality of life. So make sure that we don't have homelessness, that we don't have children who are on vacation from school and are hungry. We have partners in the community like Regions Bank, uh, like Chick-fil-A. Um, people go there, we have information, we are building, com we are building relationships here in Winter Haven as we speak. And like I said, in November, we will be at Regions Bank on First Street 
and we will be handing out food for Thanksgiving, and we will be doing the same thing for Christmas uh, for kids with the participation of the police department. Uh, we are trying to get the chief. Uh, he's been very helpful and supportive of us, and we're trying to get him to come out and, and give out some of the tours to the community. So if you guys need more information, I will definitely be outside. I'll give you my card, and you can look up the uh, organizational mission and vision statement, and I'm an open book. You ask a question, I will give you an honest answer. Thank you. Mr. Hogan, uh, what do you see as being the number one priority of city government? Uh, the number one priority, in, in my opinion, is, is you're representing the citizens of, the, of Warner Haven. And, and I, don't, I don't make a difference between the citizens of Warner Haven and the city staff of Warner Haven. It's one. It's one group. Um, we have to ensure that we're representing the whole city, not, not just a part. Um, yes, can we, can we fix everything at one time? No. But we must have a systematic approach to making sure that each part of the city and each, um, whether it's individuals or whether it's businesses, are having the same benefits and are growing in the same way. Candidates, thank you very much for your participation uh, this morning, uh, and thank you for the civility. It took a lot of my fun away, but uh, <laughs> that's appreciated. Uh, and, and thank you, everyone, for coming out this morning. Thank you. Again, thank you, everyone, and I would like to give a big thank you to Sherrod Von Chilton, PA, for sponsoring this morning's breakfast. For all of you to decide, yes, thank you very much to all of you. Um, Remember, Election Day is on November 3rd, Tuesday, November 3rd. Please encourage everyone to get out the vote. Um, if these video equipment, I'm recording on three different things. If one of them worked, the video will be um, online this afternoon, um, as well as the candidate questionnaires are on the blog. Share that information. As you see people talk about the election on social media, share the information. Um, we want to make sure that people are informed and that people know that Election Day is on November 3rd. Um, the last city commission election, I think 2,500 people voted. Let's see that number go up. So thank you for making a conscious decision to be here this morning and have a productive rest of the day.